And this is why I always comment and contradicting some of the Sonic flavors that people say on YouTube. Goddamn exceptions and inconsistency from the reverb in the mix are able to tell where this mix was recorded. Bullshit. There's no such thing as pure neutrality. Two videos are really, really getting repetitive. I mean, most of my subscribers know exactly what two brand I love right now. But that's not to say that I don't appreciate other brands. I do. Um, you know, Tongsol, Mullard, Linlay, I've said this before. I like other brands. And I think that the Pavain tubes, uh, for people who can't afford cryotone tubes, is a good alternative. I'm not going to focus on the 101Ds. I want to talk about something broader. So two questions. First one, do all tubes from all of Pavane series, the regular Horizon, Acme, do they all sound the same? No, they don't. But within each of those series, in this case, Horizon, is there a consistency amongst all Horizon tubes in terms of sonic flavor? So when I use these Horizon tubes in my rig, keyword, my rig, the Horizon tubes delivered great bass detail, a smooth top end, Nice and airy soundstage. My, maybe my quabble with them would be level of den tonal density and presence in the room as my reference tubes. But I experienced what I just described when I used the 6SN7s from Horizon, when I used the KT88s, and when I used the 101Ds. And these are all used in different contexts. So the 6SN7s, I used them in both my preamp and in my DAC. Very similar result. The KT88s, used them with a Galeon TS120. And the 101D, I used it in my preamp. Now, why do I say my rig? You got to keep something in mind when you're tube rolling. What someone tells you a tube sounds like with their gear and what it's going to sound like with your gear possibly could be very different. Why? Because a tube sounds a certain way from where it's biased. If a tube is biased, at its max, it's going to sound a certain way. If a tube is biased low, it is going to sound a certain way. It is a tube is biased a little bit above what it should handle because the manufacturer found an unbelievable set that can withstand the extra current. It's going to sound a little bit different. Now, all of these biases from one manufacturer to another, depending on the sonic flavor they're looking for, they might not be setting their auto bias adjustments exactly the same. And if there isn't an auto bias and you're doing it yourself, different story. So this is why, ladies and gentlemen, that from one system to another, sometimes there's consistency in tubes from one system to another. Sometimes there's not. And this is why a lot of people always comment and contradicting some of the sonic flavors that people say on YouTube. It's normal, guys. If, they're, if your gear is biased differently, the tube will sound different. So anyway, the 101Ds brought that Horizon flavor to my preamp. Where the things were a little bit different, though, with Horizon, I think was with the rectifier. The 274B that I used brought a really floaty soundstage. It was absolutely awesome. But it took away a little bit of that grounded density and strength that the 5U4G from Cryotone that I use normally. And this is just a matter of preference. Maybe someone will much prefer that euphoric feeling that the 274B from Horizon brought versus the more grounded in the room uh, presence that the 5U4G by Cryotone. But definitely, the Horizon series has a definitely a cohesive profile amongst all its tubes. So that's a good thing because Hi-Fi is so full of goddamn exceptions and inconsistencies. It's nuts. So it's nice to say at least that you can rely on a line of tubes that will bring you a consistent sonic flavor across its range. When you use a certain tube brand that you love, so you get a flavor that you absolutely love. You change the power tubes, let's say, in your integrated amp, but it still has a bunch of tubes in the preamp section. Or you have a bunch of tubes in your DAC, a bunch of tubes in your separate preamp, or you have a tube buffer. That's right, gee, a bunch of people are waking up the tube buffers is a cool thing. Check out the mod right, check out the space deck stuff. Yeah, tube buffer is kind of cool. 
When you have a tube brand that you love, when you change all the tubes in the chain to that brand that you love, the sonic flavor, that's when magic happens. This is definitely doing a job. Absolutely. And I am happy to replace, the, replace these from my uh, stock ones. Now, this consistency in tubes, I also recently realized that mastering studios do the same thing. Recently interviewed Stefan Marsh. He's a mastering engineer with over 30 years of experience at Marsh Mastering Studios in Los Angeles and in Virginia. This guy's resume is unreal. He's worked on such a giant chunk of music that I have been listening to in the last 30 years of my music loving life. It was a surreal experience for me to talk to one of the guys who had his hands in the last steps of making these albums what they are and what I've got to know. Awesome video. Check it out. I learned a lot. Stefan mentioned something in an interview that kind of tripped a chord inside my audio file core, but I didn't want to dive into that at, like right away. We didn't really know each other at this point. I mean, we've spoken a few times before we did the interview, but this, this wasn't a buddy that I've known for a long time. So to say that I was entirely comfortable having a debate that could have gotten heated, I wanted to, I want to know the guy a little bit more before I want to see if he wants to go down that rabbit hole. Not to mention that in terms of audio, when it comes to hard facts, I mean, this guy's got a professional career where I'm a hobbyist with a YouTube channel. It's very difficult for me to think that I'm actually going to have a real critical thinking debate with a 30 plus year experience pro at the top of his game. Kind of hard. But that being said, I really think that both sides, both camps, the studio, the professional audio guys, and the audiophile hobbyists, I think both sides could learn a lot from each other because they share something crucial. Their ears, man. Stefan said in, his, in, in the interview that he has guys in, in his surroundings that, like him, just from the reverb in the mix, are able to tell where this mix was recorded, in what studio, what room. They have an ear. Also, Stefan says that, you know, he's not into, he doesn't care about the, the snake oil stuff. And, and a lot of studio guys think that there's a lot of stuff in hi-fi that is a lot of audio foolery. And I get that. I 100% get that. Because if you use something in your rig and your rig is not tuned or some factors are not lining up to allow this part or this component or this gear, to actually show you that difference, you're not going to hear it. But I'm convinced that Stefan's ear, if he were to spend a full weekend, let's say, with me, and I got to show him a few things, guaranteed he is going to hear a difference. The proof of that is they can tell by the reverb what studio it was in. And when he switched to cryotone, he fell in love with them. And yes, he fell in them for, for, for several reasons. Their warm-up time, they're quiet. But trust me, I think the first thing he probably noticed was how clean the sound was and how good they sounded. And now as time is progressing, the ultimate advantage for him is longevity. He's still using the original cryotones he got. So I know that these two camps can work together. Imagine if they did work more together. I'll give you an example. My late neighbor, a rest in peace, passed away last year. He runs a recording studio, ran a recording studio. Oftentimes when he was done a mix, before sending it to mastering, he would bring his tracks into my cave. He wanted to hear it on my audio file setup. He said it helped him actually catch inconsistencies that some of his studio monitors were, were giving him. Because sometimes he says in a mix, like he, he, he'd do some EQ tweaks that sounded good on his monitors. And someone would say, oh yeah, well, if he has the proper monitors, that, that should never happen. Bullshit. Bullshit. There's no such thing as pure neutrality. All these good mixers, they will go and listen to their mixes on multiple different systems to make sure there's a sense of quality control there. And I saw this firsthand. Actually, I saw it twice. I saw it with my neighbor and I saw it with friends of mine that were, that were uh, recording an album. They would come in my room to have a listen so that they could have a delta in what they were hearing in studio versus what they would hear in a high-end, high-resolving rig. They wanted to know that. They then would also listen into a few different cars. Cars have very different sound systems now. They just wanted to know and see what it would feel like. Then they would get it mastered and they would come back 
And sometimes, because they would listen to their to their mastering either in a car or whatnot, and it wouldn't be exactly how they would have wanted the final product to be. But then they got into my room sometimes and they would be like, oh no, it's beautiful. Okay, it's perfect. Okay, don't need to change it. It's beautiful the way it is. And occasionally it was the opposite. It was like, ah, you know what? I knew it. No, he the 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 mastering engineer changed that little bit here. I'm gonna talk to him and find out why. Maybe there's a reason. But if they could, they would undo it and they would have it done a different way. Rare, very rare, but it happens. I think that audio files and studio pros really should work together a lot more. It's like pairing people with a creative mind with engineers. The engineers are more bound to the recipes that are around math, whereas someone that has a creative mind who is not necessarily an engineer, when they work together, the crazy concepts that the artist might think of gives the inspiration to the engineer to find that mathematical way to get there. The problem is, is that both sides can really get stuck in their in their biases. From a certain point of view. Look, some audiophiles swear by a certain type of cable or amp. Others call it snake oil. Studio folks will dismiss audiophile tweaks, focusing only on what's absolutely necessary. But there's value in both perspectives. If a mastering engineer can tell a studio by its reverb, they've got a hell of an ear that they can appreciate also some subtle gear changes, assuming the variables are all lined up. We just all need to have an open mind, I think. And if I can, I'll try to reach out to Stefan again and see if he's up for that kind of conversation. Um, but this would have to be a conversation that requires far more preparation, at least I think on my part. And I would also potentially have to maybe fly out so that I could have some pieces of equipment to show them examples of what I'm talking about. Let me know in the comments if you'd love to see a conversation or a debate between an audio file and a mastering or mixing engineer on gear, on hi-fi gear, and some of the differences that can be expected that normally would be labeled as snake oil. But if an experienced audio file can set it up to see if the mastering engineer hears the difference, that'd be interesting. But you know what? The gut feeling I got after talking to Stefan, I think he has a certain perspective, but uh, deep down, I felt like there was a tiny bit of depth. There is still good in him. 